Hi, my name is Tim Martin Vague, and I'm a certified flight instructor. Today for this video, we're going to be bringing in a student who's preparing for the oral portion of his check ride. Today we've selected a format that's more of a question answer format. In the check ride, you can expect more of a scenario format where the examiner will take a scenario of flight and begin to build uh, the question and response around that scenario. Today we're just simply gauging where the student is with his knowledge uh, as far as the oral portion. So I'll ask a question and he'll respond. I encourage you to follow along and uh, if you come to a point where you think you know the answer, pause the video, respond, and then you can hear the student's response and uh, also my response to uh, what he talks about. Now, one thing I encourage you to do also is while you're studying and preparing for your mock oral or, or excuse me, for your check ride, is to take notes, write out things that you don't understand, topics you would like to go more in depth on, and then that way, next time you go to your flight lesson with your flight instructor, you can bring that list of questions and ask and get more in-depth answers for that particular topic. For now, I think we're ready to roll on this particular mock oral. So we'll bring the student in and let's get started. All right, so, and what was your name again? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, my name is Michael. Michael, okay, yeah. hopefully I remember. I, I can't even remember my flight attendant's name half the time. Like my co-pilot. <laughs> so, Michael, are you familiar with the Airman Certification Standard, or the ACS? Uh, yes. Have you been able to look it over a little bit? Yes, and, I and have. Kind of see the expectations for the check ride. So that's kind of what we're gonna be going off of um, a lot. Uh, at least the topics will fit into the different categories within the ACS. Okay. Um, and that's the way that the, the oral will go as well, is mm -hmm. it's, it's, he's gonna pull all his information, all his questions, all his scenario based problems from the ACS and that's basically what he's going to be going off of. So right, right. up to this point, you know, it hasn't really been a priority to look at that ACS to know what's going to, you're going to be tested on and it, it shouldn't be. So you train, you, you learn the aviation world and then right now as you're getting closer to your check ride, then you start looking at the ACS okay. and going, okay, what, how can I sharpen my skills to be able to know what to expect on, on the check ride? So right, right. anyway, so we'll kind of be going off of that a little bit and then uh, we're, we're gonna be doing some chart stuff today, maybe okay. a little bit of navigation and some other things and try to keep it uh, short and sweet or concise if we can, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> we'll do, all right. We'll do our best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start out, first of all, so, so let's assume for now that you've planned a flight, right? Okay. So, so where was the uh, the location that you said from Redbird to where? Mejia. Mejia? Yeah, Mejia. Okay, so as you start, to, as you wake up in the morning, you know, this morning you woke up, it's like, okay, I'm gonna be going, starting out from Redbird. What's some of the first thoughts going through your head uh, that uh, you're gonna start preparing for this flight? So, some of the thoughts that would come to mind is actually prior to the day of, which is, you know, getting enough sleep, which is the first thing. Right. Uh, coordinating, because I, I just, I just have a, I just had a, a son, so coordinating. Congratulations! That, thank That's you, awesome. thank you. And so, uh, coordinating the time to sleep well in advance is important for me. Uh, making sure that I'm safe, you know, uh, which is I'm ensure that I'm not feeling ill. I'm taking the medications that are that is suitable for flying, and if not, then you know, ground myself. I must ensure that uh, I haven't drunk any alcohol. I I'm not stressed out and I'm emotionally stable and I'm, I'm eating I'm eating well cool yeah so those are the things I, I think about first and then I follow follow that with my flight planning very good yeah. all right well <clears throat> let's let's stop on that let's say for you know planning purposes here so last night let's say you were out with your wife you went out to dinner and had some drinks right so based mm -hmm. on this alcohol how, how, how would you know if you were safe to fly based on uh, your party last night or your yeah. out, going out so first I would need to know that I've been drinking within the past Eight hours. Okay. Right. For one, I don't drink, so I wouldn't know how it's like. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All I right. How it's like, but in the event that I do drink, you know, at least I'm prepared, right? So at least eight hours of time to ensure that I can fly. If I still feel slightly off, it's best to ground myself for 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So being able to uh, just make sure you're, you're fit mentally That's for right. that uh, particular flight. Cool. Uh, do you do you know by chance the alcohol content in the blood? 0.04. 0.04. Yeah. Very good. All right. So so basically, I mean, do you carry around a, a, a blood alcohol content <laughs> no. tester? No, you don't, right? I don't. So. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> 
So a good rule of thumb, or or what the uh, the FAA says is, you know, at least waiting eight hours prior to that flight and making sure you're you're good to go That's after right. a That's few right. drinks. Right. Very good. Okay. Well, let's talk about the emotion in that I'm safe. Okay. Thing. So when you're flying, uh, you're obviously having to retain all your mental power strictly for the safety of that particular flight, right? Right. So how can you ensure that your emotions remain in a state of safeness and readiness for that particular flight? Having a child, you know, it, it's. It brings a lot of different emotions, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Different responsibilities and, and exhaustion and tiredness for both. In my particular cases, I make sure that my family is taken care of first. There's no issues, or if there are issues, I would resolve it first. That wouldn't affect my flight. What if you had a, a rough night the night before, got a letter in the mail saying you owe a particular bill, or being that on being on your mind uh, as far as that's concerned? Would you want to fly if you had some sort of nagging thought or maybe uh, something that might be a distraction for your particular flight? I wouldn't. No. Yeah. I wouldn't. Although it, it, it seems small, it can eventually grow. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. The problems sometimes tend to, to build on each other. And, That's right. and then if you start thinking about it, then you kind of come to the point where maybe during your pre-flight, you kind of miss something or maybe That's during right. you know, right. your preparation, you, you overlook something. And then you kind of start to realize, oh, okay, maybe I'm not emotionally fit to fly because I've got this distraction in my head right, right. that's kind of pulling me down. So let's say everything's fine. You're all good to go. You've checked yourself out. You're, you're done. You're ready to go. Now you're ready to walk out to the plane to actually prep the aircraft for the flight, right? Okay. So what exactly do you need, assuming you're a private pilot at this point, what exactly do you need in order to be legal to conduct this flight as a pilot in command? In order to be uh, legal and be a pilot in command, I would need to ensure that I have legal documents re required my uh, photo ID, uh, government issued photo ID. I would need my pilot certificate and my medical certification. That's current. In the aircraft, I would need to have my, I would need to have the aircraft registration, airworthiness, airworthiness uh, certificate, uh, operating handbook, and its weight and balance. Cool, all right, good, cool. Let's go back to the uh, the documents on your personnel. So you said a photo ID, right? And then you said a, assuming you have a private pilot certificate at this yeah. point in time, right? So how would you know if you're current to be able to act as PIC with your, your pilot cert? With my pilot certificate. I would need to have at least a, uh, a flight review within the past 24 hours and have a logbook endorsement from that. Uh, not 24 hours, it's uh, 24 calendar months. Cool, yep. yes. Right. And I would need to have three takeoff and three landings at the least for day flights. Okay. If it's a night flight, I would need to have at least three takeoff and three landings to full stop. Okay, mm -hmm. good, good. Now those three takeoff <clears throat> and landings, uh, let's say it's just you going to fly the flight. Do you, do you need that solo wings? No. No. No, it's just for carrying passengers. Ah, just for carrying. Cool. Yes. All right, that's very right. good. So you brought your to bring your wife or your baby along and say, hey, come on, let's go fly, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked about, did I hear you say you had to have a medical certificate? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about that. What exactly is required with the medical? I want to have uh, at least a third class medical certificate. Okay, Yeah. third class medical. How long is that good for? If I am under the age of 40 years old, uh, it would be good for 60 calendar months. 60 calendar months. Let's say you got the uh, medical on the 5th of the month. Is it good just till the 5th of that month, 60 calendar months later? It's good until the last day of the month. Last day of the month, of the right. month. Yeah, right. very good. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So if you get your medical kind of towards the beginning of the month, you kind of have some time to really uh, That's right. That's right. <laughs> to, to yeah. get it done before it actually expires, right? Uh -huh. What are some of the other classes of medical that you would be able to obtain? Yeah, there's a second class and there's a first class medical certificate. Cool, good. Let's say, so you said you want to go commercial right you want to go all the way get your ATP yes what kind of certificate do you need to have for an ATP license first class first, first class, class certificate medical. yeah that's right how, how long is that good for I believe it's 24 calendar months or it's actually yeah 12, 12 right? yeah so, right. yeah okay. that's all right <laughs> yeah so 12 under the age of 40 yeah, right okay. to, act, to be able to exercise the ATP privileges right and that's uh, commercial as well and then yeah you jump down to the private pilot privileges right mm -hmm. and uh, then you got 60 calendar months I'm glad you brought it up that way because a lot of students they kind of say like if you have a first class medical after 12 months it jumps down to like a third class medical type of a thing which I understand what they're saying mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. not entirely accurate though right because the first class medical never jumps to another class. It's always the yeah. first class, right? That's right. So it's just the time constraint that dictates the types of privileges you can exercise. Right, right. right? right. So being able to exercise your, as you said, your private privileges on a first class medical for 60 calendar months, that's the proper way to address that. Excellent, very good. Well, you brought up uh, one good point, the idea of being current with your landings, right? So let's say you are taking your wife along and you're gonna do this cross country flight. So currency, what 
what's the difference, or do you know? Do you know the difference between currency and proficiency? Yes, I no. do. So okay. Currency is just meeting the bare legal minimums in order to exercise your privileges. Being proficient, though, is being competent. Uh, that's exercising safety, uh, good safety judgment, and being smart about your decisions. So, uh, what what was the uh, currency requirement again for passengers landings? For day day flights, it would be three takeoff and three landing. At night, it would be three takeoff and three landings till full stop. What's the recency of that? How how soon do you have to do that before you fly? Ninety calendar day. Okay, uh, yeah, so calendar. ninety days, right? Yeah, 90 days. Cool. So let me ask you, just you know, you personally. Uh huh. Let's say you did your landings in January, so beginning of January, right? And you're coming around to your 90 days, right? You're getting close to the end of uh, March. You haven't done any flying since then. Are you still legal to carry a passenger? Let's say March 20th. So you go from January 1st, you did your three takeoff and landings, and it's now March 20th. Right. 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 Are you still legal? I am. Mm -hmm. I am still legal. But I'm not proficient. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, that's where I, exactly where I was going. Yeah, yeah you read my mind. Excellent. Right. Good. So, uh, being proficient with that, would you feel comf comfortable taking a passenger if you hadn't flown in that long? I don't know. Just, this is just you. It's not. Uh, no, no, no. Not anything. No, I'm not. You know, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. So part of that would be also knowing your limitations as a as a pilot, right? Setting your your boundaries or uh, personal minimums. Yeah, the personal minimums. Exactly. Thank you. So talking about the personal minimums. Excellent. Uh, being able to step back and know when you're proficient and able and, and ready to take a flight mm -hmm. safely and competently. Very good. Excellent. Let's move on to your logbook because I know that is kind of like the basis for all your flying and being able right. to to verify whether you are indeed legal for things. Okay. So logging your three takeoff and landings within the preceding 90 days, are you required to log every single flight you fly? No. 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 What are you required to? I'm only log? required to log any flight time if I'm working on a specific certificate, uh, rating, or type rating. Uh, and then you've also mentioned flight review within the last 24 calendar months, right, 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 uh, which right. you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, being able to log that. What other kind of endorsements can you get or can you add to your private pilot certificate once you get that? I can add instrument endorsements. I can add... Okay. So, well, it, is instrument an endorsement or it would be more of a rating, right? Uh, it's a rating, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a rating. Right. Yes. So, specifically talking what can go in the logbook, right? Uh -huh. What type of endorsements, endorsements. Uh, would you be able to get? So, let's say, let's put it right, in a scenario, right. right? What about, you'd be flying a Cessna, right? Which is right. a uh, tricycle type landing gear, That's right? right. You got the nose wheel and then you got the mains. But what about the, I think it's an Aronka in the, the uh, tailwheel in the yeah, the tailwheel the in tail the uh, yeah. hangar. Like, yeah, could right. you just go out and fly that? No. 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 Oh, yeah. What do you need for that? I would need to have a long uh, training and a logbook endorsement to fly such a plane. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're going to have that certified right. flight instructor sign you off. Say, mm -hmm. yeah, you're proficient, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Very good. All right. Oh, this is a, this is a good one. So we kind of already touched on it a little bit, but they were flying this flight from Redbird over. Who's responsible for that flight? The pilot in command. The pilot in command. That's, That's exactly right. right. Mm -hmm. So, do you have your regulation you're far in with? Just because I like to read this. All right, pull up 913 okay. in your far aim. Got it. Yep. All right, so just read that A there, 913A. Yeah, the pilot in command of an aircraft is directly responsible for and is the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. Yeah, very good. So, and and this is not a this is not I'm not asking you something about this I'm just I'm just pointing out that uh, it's a serious business when we step out to that aircraft and mm -hmm. we actually sit down and we become the pilot in command right you are respons responsible and the final authority right so uh, even if you have passengers or even if you you know have you know so somebody else that's going with you maybe that's even another pilot or something, right? If you are the mm -hmm. pilot in command, I want to, you know, just reiterate that, you know, you are the final authority, right? right. And there is nothing wrong with you saying, hey, this is my decision and this is what we're going to do to be able to execute whatever we need to do in order to, you know, have a safe flight and make right. sure it's legal and all that. So, right. you know, just something to think about and uh, submit in your mind that every time you step out there, you are responsible for the entirety of the flight right? Right. and right. exactly what goes into that, the safety of it. Let's talk about some airworthiness requirements for the aircraft, right? Okay. So you talked, we talked about what you need. What about the aircraft? So I know you mentioned a few things, but let's kind of go over that again. So what exactly do we need to check and verify before we actually take the flight, make sure the aircraft is airworthy? Yeah. So the documents required for the, the aircraft would include the uh, airworthiness certificate, current and updated registration, operating handbook, and updated weight and balance. Very good. Where, where do we find that weight and balance information? The weight and balance can be found typically in its, in the operating handbook. 
but if there are changes in the equipment, it should be included with the operating handbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah very good. Yeah, so it's all all that's in the uh, operating handbook. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, we're required to carry that for every flight that we do. Oh, registration. This is kind of a good question too. What are you looking for when you're looking at the registration specifically? The dates. Um, the dates. Yeah. yeah, very good. How long is the registration good for? They're good for three calendar years. Three calendar years. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we talked about uh, the documents required to be in the flight, about the aircraft itself. Uh, yeah. What are we looking for to be on the aircraft? Like the equipment? Yes, that? equipment. Okay, Sorry, equipment. Thanks. Yeah. So there has to be equipment uh, that's required for VFR day flight. So that would include the altimeter, tachometer. If you're flying one that has a manifold pressure gauge, you need one, uh, you need the instrument operator. Do you have a manifold gauge in your Cessna 172? No. Okay, <laughs> no. cool. Airspeed indicator, uh, temperature gauge, oil temperature gauge, fuel gauge, the um, anti-collision lights, magnetic compass, the ELT, safety belts and shorter harnesses and any other equipment that follows its supplemental type certificate. Cool. And what, what about inspections for the aircraft? Uh, inspections would include the annual inspection, which is every 12 calendar months, VR check every 30 calendar days, the 100R inspection, uh, the altimeter and pedostatic port system, which should be inspected every 24 calendar months, the transponder 24 calendar months as well, and the ELT 24 calendar months as, as well. Cool, very good. All right, how about the 100 hour? You're, you're just taking a flight from here to Weaversville and no instruction is necessary, whatever, is it? Is 100 hour required? Uh, if the plane is used for composition and higher, yes, it is. Okay. But if it's like my own plane and I use it, uh, I don't need to. Okay. All right. Now let's say we're going to take it at night, take the aircraft out, planning on coming back after sunset. Uh, is there any additional equipment that needs to be on board the aircraft? Equipment that are required would include any fuses, you know, if we have fuses in our aircraft, the landing lights, anti-collision lights and position lights, and your source of power. Cool. All right. Well, uh, tell you what, let's get out a chart sectional okay. chart and uh, let's kind of go through some scenarios here and work through uh, a flight potentially hopefully okay what do you have with you i have an outdated chart but <laughs> it's a chart. okay so or at least should we use the th iPad? that's actually you, you bring up a good point here so sectionals let's talk about those real quick okay. so how long are they good for if it's expired should we use it no, we right. should not use that. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, definitely in the check ride, you don't want to be pulling out something that's outdated right? Got or it, invalid, it. right? So, so let's go ahead and use the iPad, yeah. So uh, as we're, we're planning this flight from Redbird, let's talk a little bit about airport operations and airspace here. So what kind of airspace are we looking at for Redbird right now? We're looking at Class Delta. Class Delta airspace. That's Under right. Class Bravo airspace. Under the Class Bravo, that's right. Mm -hmm. Cool, so are there any particular requirements we need to be able to operate inside Class Delta airspace? And Class Delta airspace, um, we do need to establish two-way communications with ATC only. Okay, yeah. very good. Is there anything else as far as equipment-wise that we're gonna need? Uh, in in regards to equipment, no. No, okay. Uh, so not strictly for Redbird. Right? right, right. But, however, we are, as you mentioned, under oh. Bravo, right? Oh, so, yes, which, yes. cool. So, what do we need for that? Um, uh, multi transponder. Multi transponder. Multi transponder. Cool. All right, yeah. so ADSB, right? Uh, ADSB. Yeah. Let me ask you this then. What's this, yeah, uh, what's this pink line? Yeah, multi, yeah, multi veil. Multi veil, right? Yeah, so anything within there. That's right. That requires the uh, transponder. Yeah, very good. All right, well, let's talk about the different, uh, talk about the airspace. So, what, uh, what different types of airspace do we have? So we do have class Alpha Aerospace, class Bob Aerospace, Charlie, Delta, Echo, and Golf. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Cool. We mentioned the Bravo. We mentioned the Delta already. Uh, what what's uh, Alpha? Let's say class A Aerospace. Class A Aerospace is um, airspace at eighteen thousand feet MSL up to flight level six hundred. Yeah, very mm -hmm. good. Yeah, sixty there worth the sixty thousand feet up there, right? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty high up in the atmosphere, right? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Uh, just kind of a little sidetrack here. As far as weather phenomena, mm -hmm. what type of storm can reach up to about sixty thousand? You know, uh, tarry cumulonimbus. Yeah, uh, right. Storms. Or the thunderstorms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we've got we're talking about A, B. Um, oh, let's talk about Bravo airspace. So, how how big is usually Bravo airspace, or how do they how do they uh, decide it? So Bravo Airspace, uh, they're as big to accommodate IFR operations. They resemble an upside down wedding cake with different uh, shelves. They typically are up to 10,000 feet MSL and 
each one are tailored to accommodate the, the location. Yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah, it's all tailored for the specific type of airport, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, can you just fly around willy-nilly in a Bravo airspace? No. No. So, so what do you need to be able to operate in Bravo airspace? You need to have clearance. Yeah, you gotta have clearance, right? Mm -hmm. They have to say something specific. Clear it to the Bravo. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Cleared into the Bravo, right? Clear you have to hear the, the words cleared into the Bravo, right? That's right, that's right. If you don't hear that, sorry, Jack, you ain't going in, right? Yeah. <laughs> no go. Very good. Okay, cool. Well, what kind of uh, airspace do we have right below Bravo? Not, not, sorry, not according to the chart, but uh, what's the next class of airspace we're talking about? Uh, class Charlie? Yeah, Class Charlie airspace. Class cool, Charlie very good. Uh, typically, how big would a Charlie airspace be? They have, it's similar uh, to wedding, uh, upside down wedding cake. Uh, it's from the surface up until, let's see here. If I remember. If you want, you can look it up. You know where to find that? Uh, yes, I do. I was correct, which is, uh, I, I, mine was 4,000 uh, feet MSL. Cool. Yeah, but I had a slight, a slight contradiction. Between 4,000 and 6,000. Yeah, no, 6, cool, cool. Yeah, I yeah. mean, again, if you, if you ever need to look something up, you know, feel free to do so. It's like, hey, you know what? Let me double check that real mm -hmm, quick. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you know uh, any other location besides the PHAC that you can find it, uh, airspace? Me? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly right. Yeah, so either one would work. Yeah, yeah, very good. Cool. All right. So, purpose of Charlie, a little more higher volume than uh, Delta, right? But not right. quite as big as Bravo. It's the core of Class Charlie extends a uh, 5 nautical mile radius. Uh, his upper shell has a 10 nautical mile radius from 1,200 feet to 4,000 feet. And it has a 20 nautical mile, out of, 20 nautical mile out of area. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Or you start talking to him or you start to. Uh... Yeah, you need to get you know, two way communication. Yeah, two way. Yep, very good. That's Excellent. Right. And then you got the Delta, which we already talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about what's the next class after Delta? Class Echo Airspace. Yeah, Echo Airspace. That's mm -hmm. right. And where does that extend? It can extend above Class Golf Airspace, 700 feet AGL or 1,200 feet AGL up until the next underlying airspace. Yeah. It, which could be, uh, you know, under any underlying controlled airspace or it can be up until 18,000 feet MSL. Yeah, very good, right? All yeah. that airspace. What's the purpose of Class Echo Airspace? Is it, well, let me ask, well, let me ask you this. Uh, is Echo controlled or non-controlled? It can be both. Well, excuse me. It's, it's controlled. It is controlled. It's yes, controlled. that's exactly right. Yes, it's controlled airspace, right? So basically, it's for IFR purposes. That's right. Right, so which, yeah, obviously, you're going to learn about it at some other point. But it is controlled, considered controlled airspace. Mm -hmm. Even though it is not controlled by a particular tower, it is governed and controlled by a particular agency, right? Not right, that the right. controls and you have to have permission, but that they are monitoring it and allowing uh, IFR operations. You know, worry about that. I don't know why I'm going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> cool, very good. All right, and then you got golf airspace, right? Golf is uncontrolled, controlled. Uncontrolled. Controlled. Uncontrolled. That's yeah, right. very good. Exactly. That's exactly right. Down uh, 700 feet down or 1,200 feet down, right? That's depending right. on where it is and whatever right. the case may be. So cool. Very good. Let's talk about speeds. Now, okay. speed is not necessarily something you're going to be worried about in a Cessna. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> you can't even make, maintain <laughs> max speed as far as the regulations are concerned. Yeah. But what, what kind of air speeds or do you know air speeds for the particular types of air spaces? I know that under 10,000 feet MSL, air speed is 250 knots max up until 4 knots nautical miles and 2,600 2, feet it's AGL of an airport, which is uh, 200 feet, not uh, 200 knots, excuse me. 200 knots, yeah. cool, all right. How about in uh, Class Bravo? Is there an airspeed restriction in Class Bravo airspace? Yes, yes, there is. There is? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should be saying, I don't know. You don't know, okay, I don't all know. right. You know, 250 knots below 10,000 feet, Bravo does not have a speed restriction. Oh, okay. Uh, so you could be in the Bravo, but if you're below 10,000 feet, then you, you gotta be below 250 knots, but above that, you don't have to. Cool. All righty, let's talk about this chart here. So it looks okay. like we're gonna be uh, going along this route here. So about what, 65 miles or so-ish nautical miles, right? Yeah. That looks kind of cool. Yeah. Looks good. Let's talk about some things along the route here. Okay. So as you mentioned, we'd be going out underneath the Bravo. In this particular area, how high um, do we know that we can uh, climb to if we're underneath the Bravo as we start our uh, southward departure? Yeah, we can fly up until 3,000 uh, feet MSL, but not including. As we exit out class delta airspace, as we come out of this shelf, our limit is 4,000. And as we come out of this shelf, it's, was it still 4,000? Yep. Yeah, still, still 4,000. 4, yep. So here's the, so what's the difference between this shelf and this shelf? Uh, let's see. This is uh, up to 10,000 MSL. 
Um, and this the, this shelf here is up to eleven thousand. Yeah, very good. Yeah, there's a difference right there. So, mm -hmm. so even though they have the same base, the heights are different, which is right. why they have that separation there. Yeah, very right, good. Right. All right. So I I noticed we have these uh, this yellow area here. Um, uh, as we start to our, our departure to the south, so mm -hmm. uh, what is that yellow area? So yellow area indicate a congested zone or city, and they also represent the outlines of a city at night uh, when it's lit up. Yeah, very good, cool. Yeah. And what are our altitude restrictions as we fly over congested versus non-congested areas? Over congested areas, the minimum safe altitude is at least 1,000 feet from the highest obstruction uh, in the area, or in general, but if it's uh, not congested there, it's at least 500 feet. Yeah, cool, very yeah. good, all right. So you talked about, you know, obstacles and stuff. So what uh, what do we have here? It looks like we have some sort of tower or something, yeah. right? What can we expect that tower to be at as far as altitude wise? The top number indicates its height, MSL, uh, which is 757 feet. Uh, it's height above ground is 258 feet. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So a kind of fun, ridiculous way to think about it is this is the altitude you're going to read your altimeter if you hit the obstacle and this is how far you're going to fall to the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> ridiculous way of looking at it, but mm -hmm. it, it is true. It helps cement in your mind. Okay, what are we talking about? AGL or uh, MSL, you know, type of a thing. Very good. All right. So we fly south here. We've got a couple of different items here to look at. Oh, what's this here running through our uh, course? Uh, that looks like a power line. This black line? Yeah, they got a power line there. How about this one here? With the cross sections. Uh, the, the, the yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I can I can look it up. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Where would you go to look it up? It would be on this on the side of the terminal area charts. Uh, sorry, uh, of the V4 charts. Mm -hmm. There are legends there. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so I'll just tell you, this is power uh, railroad track here. A railroad. Yeah. Track. So you get little slants. Oh, railroad track, which are actually very easy to spot from the air. Oh, uh, railroad okay. tracks are kind of okay. cool. Uh, and then we got this kind of running through here. What's that? That's the uh, freeway. Yeah, highway. highway. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Mm -hmm. A couple of lakes there. Very yeah. good. Um, cool. Ooh, what's this here? That is a... Uh... So same thing, right? We'd go look it up. Yeah. So glider operations, right? The A uh, denotes uh, something a little different. Oh, here it is right here. Uh, aerobatic practice aerobatic area. There we practice. go. So we're flying around here. We found the railroad tracks. We got the uh, the rail the highways, more congested area city of uh, Bardwell looks like. So it's labeled mm -hmm. there with the, the lakes. Very good. Oh, what's uh, what's this number right here? Uh, this number indicates the highest obstacle. And MSL. So what were, what are the uh, boundaries for that? Uh, for for that, the boundaries for it. Like what what separates this thirteen from this twelve? The square. Yeah. yeah right. The, it, the grid. Yeah. So basically, the uh, uh, longitude lines of longitude, right, longitude right, and latitude, right. right? That kind of uh, separate those. It's actually the obstacle rounded to the nearest hundred plus hundred feet. What kind of airspace are we talking about for our destination airport? Uh, we have a class Echo airspace. Echo. Is it? It's cla from class Golf to uh, class Echo airspace. Yeah, very good. So yeah. the, the airport itself actually lies within what airspace? Class Golf. Golf airspace, right, right. yeah. And then so. this denotes that you got the Echo above it, right? right Starting right. at about, looks like 700, 700 feet. feet. Yep, yeah. very good. Excellent, cool. What's a quick way to read some information uh, about that airport uh, just by looking at the, the, the sectional chart? Uh, right here, mm -hmm. this information box right yeah, there. Yeah, cool, all right, cool. You wanna go ahead and decipher that for me? Sure. So here yeah, Limestone County, this is the uh, identifier, airport identifier. This is the AWOS, which is the local frequency to get an updated weather information at 127.275. 545 is the field elevation. It is a light airport with 500 feet of available runway for use. 500? Oh, excuse me. 5,000. 5,000. 5, there we go. That sounds yeah. a little bit better. Yeah, and... 500 yes. is kind of short. It is, it is kind of short. <laughs> and 122.8 is the common uh, traffic uh, C CTAF. Yeah, very good. Yeah, right. Let we'll other pilots know your intention. You approach mm -hmm. the airport. Cool. Uh, anything in this particular uh, airport diagram here that kind of tells us what's going on? If we could just quick glance at it. Yeah, there's a lot of obstructions. Uh, mm -hmm. Northeast. A lot of obstructions. North North mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Are any of uh, are any of these obstructions lighted or no, lit? I guess they're not. no, they're no, not. They're not. Cool. Very good. How about the star? What does that star say? The star indicates that it has a uh, rotating beacon. Yeah, rotating beacon. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can find it at night. Good thing to know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Here we go. What's uh, what's this little guy right here? That's a VOR. VOR. Mm -hmm. What's that? Uh, VOR is a uh, uh, very high frequency omnidirectional radio. Yeah, very good. So used for what do we use it for? It's used to uh, identify 
your location from the view. Yeah, navigation, right? Navigation. Yeah, one way to navigate, right? So, which VOR is actually pretty cool. Do you know how the VOR works? Actual physical frequencies and stuff, how it s sends out the signals? Um, if not, that's fine. Yeah, I don't. Okay, I don't, cool. I can find out. This is pretty cool. Yeah. So actually, if someone ever asks you that, you say, oh, well, it works like a lighthouse. Well, how does a lighthouse work, right? Yeah. So you know how a lighthouse works where it uh, has a rotating light that sweeps around? Mm -hmm. Well, what the lighthouse also has on top of it is a red, a uh, red beacon, like a, a light. Oh yeah. yeah. And so what happens is every time that white sweeping light faces true north, the red light flashes on the beacon, oh, okay. uh, on the lighthouse. Okay. So then what you what you do is when you're looking at the lighthouse, you, you notice the time or, or you notice the start of when the beacon flashes. And then when the light hits you and you count uh, the, the number of seconds and then you can calculate exactly where you are in relation to the lighthouse. Oh, okay. So the VR, VOR actually works in this exact same way. It gives oh. a pulse and a sweep, a pulse and a sweep, pulse and a sweep. So the radio receiver actually calculates the time it receives the sweep from the pulse and calculates where you are directionally from the VOR, right? Got it. Uh, and it, it does that three times a second. So it's pulse sweep, pulse sweep, yeah. pulse sweep. So yeah. it's very quick, yeah. right? So anyway, that's that's how a VOR works, which is kind of cool. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's used for navigation, uh, the 360 degree, uh, 360 radials, right? From all the way around the VOR there. What's another way to navigate? So we got VOR or uh, you know, VOR navigation. Uh, yeah, what's the, some other ways that you use? Uh, there's VOR, RNAV, mm -hmm. um, and then there is pilotage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pilotage and dead, and reckoning. dead reckoning, right? Sure. Cool, very good. Uh, what's pilotage? You remember? Yeah, pilotage is just looking at outside. Yeah, yeah that's right. Outside. That's that's the best part, right? Yeah. That's the funnest, right? You just fly from point to point. Oh, look at that! There's uh, there's that airport. Okay, check. Yeah, yeah. right. Now fly to this uh, city here, or fly to this lake, and kind of work my way down to my. Yeah, that that's kind of fun. Yeah, that's yeah. just going out and shooting the breeze, right? Yeah, yeah. we're going out. Dead reckoning, though. That's a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. So, what do we use for dead reckoning navigation? Particular to help us organize our we use checkpoints. plots. Yeah, we use checkpoints. Mm -hmm. uh, we use um, we use a, nav a navigation log, right? That's right. Yeah. So, navigation. what are some of the components in the navigation log that we use? Yeah. So some co some components include the checkpoints, the direction in terms of true course. Yeah, yeah, very yeah, good. Followed yeah, followed by mm -hmm. magnetic course, wind correction angle. There's the magnetic variation boxes to to input for your calculation. Yeah, very then you good. Have the compass heading. Exactly. What's another big thing with navigation logs that we're concerned about uh, as far as yes we've got our heading mm -hmm. right we've got our uh, checkpoints that you've mentioned right. uh, but what specifically are we concerned about when we use a nav navigation log as far as time and what time and distance and distance and the worried about fuel Fuel, fuel burn, yes. right? One of the reasons of the nav log specifically is to calculate exactly how much fuel we're going to need to go from point A to point B, right? right. So you're exactly right. We find our checkpoints, we find our direction that we're, we're headed, and we get our wind correction angle. Uh, and then based on all that and everything, we calculate our fuel burn, right? right. Okay, how right. much fuel we're going to need. So for this particular flight, we're going on a VFR flight cross country. What are our fuel requirements? Uh, our fuel requirements is enough fuel to fire to fly the entire flight um, additionally to an alternate and 30 minutes of cruising flight time well actually not to an alternate right it's just in reserve right oh in reserve yeah oh. obviously to make it to an alternate if we need one right which yeah. is actually i was going to talk about here in just a second uh but yeah so basically we have vfr how many minutes of reserve fuel do we need to have for day vfr 30 minutes 30 minutes how many at night 45 45 that's exactly right